Now, when we talk about, guys, remember, must I take the buzz away from the children? All right, so. When we talk about evidence for evolution, I forgot to mention one. Those of you who have that, those of you who have that uh, co concept map that we did that day, we ne I never added biogeography. Biogeography is that the actual uh, position of animals in the ecosystem across space and time is another evidence. That's actually something that, that Darwin used, right? For example, there are, there are, there, there's going to be both in, in, um, in environments which are similar, there will be similar traits, right? And in, and in environments that are different, similar animals will be different. That you can see in the Galapagos Islands, that's what Darwin saw. But he also saw, but there's also sugar gliders and flying squirrels in both wood-like land forests of completely different continents because the pressure is similar to be able to hover from tree to tree, right? So whenever the pressure is similar, similar features show up in different organisms, and wherever the, the pressure is different, different or the similar organisms will have different features. And that is also a great evidence for evolution by geography, okay? Now, I actually already talked about 1B1, which is what's on the calendar for today, because when I did evidence for evolution, I talked about this. The common core processes and common core structures. So we kind of already have everything in here. So I'm just going to go through it really quick, and then we'll talk about uh, the lab and what's, what I expect you guys to do from it, okay? So in biology, it's a very important concept. Those of you who watch Bozeman, you should watch Bozeman, by the way. It's like, it's almost as if Bozeman is the second teacher you have. You should always watch him, okay? And uh, I want to be very clear about this. Yesterday, uh, I don't know if I should say this. I'll say it anyway. Yesterday, I had Melissa Machado here, one of my best students from last year. And we had a conversation about how she survived biology and uh, there was another student here that was struggling right now and uh, who's friends with them and then they were talking about you know what can we do to get better and that kind of stuff and then Melissa was talking about her last year now there are some students who can get through this without reading just listening to me all right understand everything I'm saying and it, it will be enough for them to pass you may or may not be that kind of a student you can tell by how you're doing on the FRQs if you are not doing well on the FRQs you are not going to do well on the test. You're not going to do well on the AP test. You know, you know what I'm saying? The, the levels, and, and, and it's, okay. And also, it's funny. The people who are doing excellent on the FRQs also are say, the same people that have a bunch of extra credit homework. You know what I'm saying? So there seems to be a connection there. If you are taking notes, if you're doing the EKs, if you're doing the quizzes, you're doing the practices, right? You're doing class notes and uploading them online. Everything you can do for grades, you know, there was the same people who did lots of the parts of the lab, you know, so uh, capitalize on that. Speaking of the lab, today I'm going to grade them. I know the grades are already counting against you, but the, you haven't received the points that you've turned in yet. But as of tonight, around 10 o'clock, you can log in online, and whatever's up there should be your grade. How do you know if you've got graded or not? You should get a reply from me saying, okay, you know, this is, I've, gr I've graded it or I've added comments to your paper or whatever. And I remember that in the resource folder of Lab 2, there is a document called uh, Common Mistakes. And in that document, I'll have the comments that I am making based on for everybody to read. Even if you don't have those mistakes, it might be beneficial for you to read that so you can learn from the lab now, get feedback from it. You know what I'm saying? When we learn and we make mistakes and we turn things in, it's very important to get feedback. So that's why... That's my feedback to you. So if you see a comment saying C8 attached to your conclusion questions, go to the, go to the go column of mistakes, see what C8 is all about, see what you did wrong, see what you should have done. Is that clear? Grade yourself, so to speak. All right? Because I don't have enough time to add the same comments to 30 different people. If I notice the same people are doing the same mistakes, I just did it that way. It's more efficient. Sometimes I'll give a comment to something that you said. 
that you didn't say or they didn't make sense of something you said that a lot of people did, other people did not say. Okay? So, comment. In Bozeman, he talks a lot about this in lots of his videos. The whole connection in biology between structure and function. If there's a structure for in life, it evolved to perform a function. It's always the case. Anytime we have a structure, it exists because of a function. You know? So, when you talk about conserve core processes, we're talking about functions that life does. When we're talking about conserve core structures, we're talking about structures that life, life has, right? Conserve core structures, and this is going to be important for the lab we're going to talk about in a second, are structures which are so important, right, that uh, they are homologous to a large number of organisms in the tree of life, right? So we had a whole FRQ about this. Remember that? So there are lots of conserve core structures, that's only a case, which are uh, all life has, right? For example, you have... Uh, DNA and RNA being the carriers of genetic information, right? They have the same building blocks for that, the same nucleotides. All life forms have that, the same four nucleotides. They have the same um, code. is the same for both of them, even though it's more of a process, right? So they have this. So they have the same proteins. They have the same 20 amino acids, right? Every single life form has ribosomes. Every single life form have two have membranes which are made of two layers, right? All life forms have the same similar enzymes that do glycolysis, right? So there's a lot of things which are the same. As far as conserved core processes, that are the same for all life forms. Pretty much every life form on Earth reads the genetic code the same way. Does DNA application the same way? Does protein synthesis the same basic way, right? They would all pretty much do glycolysis the same way, right? The burning of sugar, so to speak, right? And so these core metabolic processes are, are indication of the universality of life. Translation, transcription, DNA replication, RNA, RNA uh, um, acting as the bridge between DNA and, and, and proteins, right? And metabolic pathways to make energy. ATP, universally the most important energy currency of the cell. That's more of a structure. Likewise, there are conserved core structures that show that all eukaryotes are connected. That all of them have cytoskeletons, a network of fibers that supports cell movement, transport within the cell, and cell structure, right? The organelles of the cell move around, tracking in roads made up of a cytoplasmic cyto cytoskeleton material. We'll show you a video on this when we do cytology later in the year. All the eukaryotes have membrane-bound organelles. They have endomembrane systems. The rough ER, the smooth ER, the nucleus, the Golgi apparatus, and the vesicles, right? They all have these energy organelles, especially mitochondria. Some also have a second endosymbiont called chloroplast, right? They also have linear chromosomes instead of circular chromosomes like all the bacteria do. And, it, and typically those chromosomes are paired, paired linear chromosomes. They're at least diploid, typically. They, have, they also have uh, the nuclear, nucleus, right? And they have advanced protein synthesis processes, right? And in the case of eukaryotes, most of them will have the Krebs cycle, which happens inside the mitochondria, right? And so these types of metabolic processes that are unique and structures that are unique to eukaryotes show us that eukaryotes are, are all related. Now, something as important as glycolysis, which powers pretty much the cell, because even though it only produces a little bit of ATP, it's the beginning of breaking down the sugar. And you don't make, actually end up getting all the energy that you get through the Krebs cycle and the ETC unless you start it by doing glycolysis. So that enzyme or oh, those enzymes, because there's several, involved in doing glycolysis are so important that if a mutation happens in their code, it could screw up the organism's ability to survive altogether. You see that? So mutations that affect that enzyme by changing the DNA code that codes for it are very unlikely to be conserved. On the other hand, 
you take I mean, uh, the, the gene sequence of that enzyme is likely to be conserved. Because the uh, only mutation that improves, right, that, that enzyme would be selected for, of course. But that's what I'm trying to say here is that any conserved core process is so important that mutations on them are very slow. That is why we use ribosomal RNA to classify ancient life forms apart from each other. So when we're talking about classifying the domains of life, one of the easiest ways to do it is to look at the ribosomal RNA because the most perhaps important piece of genetic information is genetic information to make ribosomes. It is actually a conserved core structure that all life has, right? So if you screw up the ribosomes, all the other proteins, all the other enzymes, and therefore all the other metabolism of life can happen. So ribosomes are cri critical. So mutations affecting ribosomes are rare. Are you with me? What that means is that ribosomes genetic code is very stable across the history of time. On the other hand, you look at something like a mitochondria. Mitochondria, it's something that, it's a, basically a bacteria. It doesn't have the kind of advanced genetic regulation and genetic um, monitoring mechanisms that eukaryotes have to make sure that the, the DNA is structure and code is maintained accurately. They, by definition, prefer to mutate faster. That's kind of built in into their survival strategy. Evolution favors the bold in the bacteria as in like mutate, mutating. Because think about it, when you're making thousands of children per day, millions of children per day, it doesn't really matter half of them die because they're mutants. Are you with me? So the mutations is what allows them to, to uh, the mutation rate of bacteria is a lot faster. But isn't a mitochondria basically a bacteria living inside of us, right? Therefore, the DNA that's inside of it, because remember, bacteria has their own DNA, which is evidence for the fact that endocytosis must have happened, right? And remember, we talked about, when we talk about the history of life, that that must have been an early step. Now, if bacteria DNA mutates faster, it's the opposite of ribosomal DNA. Bacterial DNA can mutate so fast, right, that in just a few generations, you can tell the difference between two of them. So, ribosomal RNA changes are very slow, but a mitochondrial DNA changes are very fast. And there's a million other things in between. Now, the rate at which mutations happens, period, is pretty constant throughout life. But those mutations are often fixed more in eukaryotic genes. And they're also selected for or against more strongly if they are important genes. Are you with me what I'm saying? I kind of talked about this, this, this the day I talked about evidence of evolution. This means that if a gene is important, it can be a slow molecular clock. You know what I'm saying? It's a clock whose ticket hand ticks very, very slowly. Now, why would I want? Why would I use a clock like that? Well, let's think about this. Is this a precise clock, the one we have in the wall here? What do you think? Is it precise enough to do the job that it here is here for? Yes. Because what do we need here? We need an hour and thirty minutes, right, of measuring time. So does the seconds really matter here? Do we even need the second hand if we really think about it? No. Not really, right? Now, if you're trying to time how long your lifetime is, do you even need an hour ahead? Do you even need a day ahead? What hand do we use for that? Years. We use years and maybe months. Maybe months. Maybe even decades in our lifetime. If we're trying to talk about the history of humankind, what do we use for that in history class? Century. Century. If you try to talk about the history of geological time, we use eras or epochs. Are you with me what I'm saying? So the type of precision that we need depends on how much we want to separate things. So let me start explaining what I'm talking about. If I want to compare the height of Mount Everest and the height of Mount Vesuvius, right? Okay? Or Mount Olympus and Mars. Right? I'm going to compare the height of these different built, uh, uh, mountains. Will a meter stick be a good idea? No. No. I need a less precise. It'll be, a, it'll be decent. Are you with me, I'm saying? Talk about kilometers. Now, we have actually measured the Everest to down to centimeters. Right? 
and even millimeters with geo-surveying and stuff like that, okay? GPS systems and other systems, right, to do that. Be only because we're interested in tracking it and how much it's growing and stuff like that, all right? And seeing if it truly is the tallest one. You know, it's only taller than K2 by a little bit, you know? But, by the way, you guys know that Everest is not actually the highest point on Earth? If you think about it. By highest, I mean from the center of the Earth. Because the Earth is an oblate sphere, right? So that means that the middle is actually about 30 kilometers wider than the top. Everest is a little off the top. If you look at the globe that's rotating over here, right? Go on back over there. So you can do that. So Everest, Everest is actually almost the same latitude that we're at, actually. So it's about 30 degrees, 33 degrees north of the equator. So by then, it's actually a few kilometers closer to the nucleus, or to, the, to the center of the Earth, than, than the, uh, than the say, a mountain in Chile. In the Andes. So mountains in the Andes, uh, in uh, Ecuador, right, are actually taller if you measure from the center of the earth. And if you measure from the base of the mountain to the top of the mountain, Everest loses again. Because there's, there's a, uh, in Hawaii, there's a mountain that's almost 3,000 meters high, but it starts in the bottom of the Pacific, 10,000 feet below, right? I broke the earth! <laughs> it starts, it starts from, uh, the bottom of the Pacific, 10,000. Uh, so sorry if I call the Earth good. Challenge accepted. Ah! I thought I had it. I'm usually bad at it. Can I move my Oh, really? Hi! No. So, you can do it though if you want. Now, as I was saying, it's not, it's not actually the tallest mountain, but just a, just a curiosity thing. Well, it depends on how you decide your tallest is. If you talk about the size of the mountain, that mountain, I forgot the name of it, but the mountain in Hawaii would be, would be a good example of something that's taller, that's taller than it. All right, anyway, it's the tallest above sea level point. It is the tallest point above sea level. If you start from sea level, then it would be, well, it's just that the sea level is further from the center of the earth in some places than others. Right now, if you really think about that, what that it, oh, never mind. Okay, <laughs> I'm, I'm navigating, I need to talk about biology. So, uh, deviating, I need to talk about biology. So, as, as I was saying before, I was talking about the Mount Everest, I was talking about measurements that you need to use. Right, that's my point. I was trying to drive across. Now, if I'm trying to tell the difference between these two things, do I use a meter stick now? No. Just a meter. No, I need a ruler that has millimeters in it. So if I'm trying to tell that how much time ago me and him share a common share a common ancestor, <laughs> should I use a clock that ticks slower or a clock that ticks, ticks faster? Do I need a clock with milliseconds or a clock with ages? No, with him and him. I need a faster clock. Right? Now if I'm trying to tell me and the bacteria, how long ago we share a common ancestor, yeah, do I need a slow clock or a fast clock there? Slow, slow clock. clock would be enough. So to separate me from the bacteria, I analyze ribosomal RNA, right? But to separate myself from a branch that's right near me in the tree of life, it's better to use something that mutates faster because that can be more precise. Are you with me? Now, if you do that, you can actually find out exactly how long he and I, by looking at our mitochondrial DNA, we can actually see, because our mitochondria, at some point, we share a mother. Are you with me? My grandma's mother, 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 because mitochondria gets passed down by the mother line, because the, the sperm never goes inside the egg, right? Only the, only the, the all the mitochondria you have come from your mom, which means if you had as a mitochondrial disorder, you cannot inherit it, right? Um, so if he has a problem, metabolic problem, because of mitochondria, he has def a defective gene, you wouldn't have a problem. You would only have that problem if your mom had a problem. So it's an example of a non-Mendelian pattern of inheritance. It doesn't obey Mendelian laws because it's not passing on by, you know, crosses, right? It's, but which proves, of course, mitochondria has its own DNA and its own living, it's a, its own living thing if you really think about it. But anyway, my point is, if we shared, track this maternal line somewhere down the line, 
we will find a common ancestor together, right? And we can then, how do we know that though? Because I can count how many of his mitochondrial genes, how many mutations, how many base pair differences his genes and my genes have. Are you with me? And let's say I get four, and I know that it takes an X amount of years on average per mutation together. So I just multiply four times that number, and that will tell me how long ago most likely we shared a common ancestor. And then we do some genealogy studies, and we find out the numbers agree. For example, when we do that kind of mitochondrial DNA study to compare popu uh, Caucasian populations with Native American populations, the number is about 22,000 years. Why does that make sense? 20, 20,000 years. Ice ages, the crossing of the Bering Bridge. Are you with me? I'm sorry to say. It's actually not 22. It's 12. Sorry. About 12,000 years. Um, so, something closer between 10 and 12. So, my point is, about 10,000 years ago, when there was a break in the Ice Ages, people crossed the Bering, Bre Bering, Bering Bridge thing. But way before then, the population that ended up doing that crossing had already split from the Caucasians that went to Europe, right? Because Repopulation started in Africa, we think, right? And then they, some people migrated to, to Asia, some people migrated to Europe, right? And then those populations were already kind of isolated, right? And then uh, isolation went even further when it crossed a, a subset of the Asiatic population, crossed the Bering Bre Bridge to the Americas. And we think that happened about 10,000 years ago. And so uh, by, by um, archaeological evidence and carbon dating of actual arrowheads that you can find that have a wood on it. It's early enough yes, uh, that you can still do carbon dating successfully, right? And then, if, uh, uh, remember, you don't do carbon dating for geological scale, but for something less than 25,000 years, it's pretty accurate, right? Now, if you do that, it's interesting that the number that you do with uh, biochemical data agrees with our studies from geological and archaeological data, right, in this sense. And you don't even have to go that far if you just do your family and my family. It's amazing that you do the genealogy and you find the numbers to be the same. And that kind of congruence you, you tells us that we're doing something right. That's the spirit of what we're doing in Lab 3 in the first part of it. So I'm going to start now by uh, going over this. Now, I told you guys that it's, it's not, you cannot, okay, you could show up to class completely unprepared. But that's not the process. Okay? Every week there's a reading of the week. If you have not been reading, when the test comes, you're going to regret it. And, I, and then the problem is, the problem is that I, on one day you wake up and say, I'm going to start reading now. And then you look at everything you haven't read. Right? And then you start freaking out and say, oh shit, it's too late for me to do it. Don't think like that. If you haven't started reading and you have a bunch of chapters that have already passed on the reading list, suggest so a reading pace. Or even some that the homework was already due and you didn't do it yet, right? Forget them. Forget them all. And just do this week's reading list. And move forward. From now on, you're doing it right. Are you with me? And then, once a week, you throw back one chapter. And if you're not going to read it, at least read the lecture outline and watch some Bozeman videos. But you need to study. The most important thing is that. And then you have the extra credit homework to do. And then you have to prepare for labs and do lab work a little bit every day. Don't make the same mistake you live for lab two. Every day. 15 minutes. Every day. If you don't do that, it will become a monster. I'm telling you. You don't do it. You're going to regret it. Okay? Don't make the same mistake you live for lab two. Also, deadlines to encourage you not to make the same mistake. Deadlines will be different this time. Okay? If we did a part today, you have one week to turn in the work from that part. And it's not on the calendar because I decided to do that now and I'm not going to even put it on the calendar until I have the time to do it. But from now on, if we're working on part A next class, right, one week after that day is the last day to turn in the work for part A. I understand? Now, you still get at the end points for your final submission. And the points for final submission come from how complete your in and how well done and how well organized your entire submission is. So, the, uh, so in that, at that point, you can still get points for, for, um, it affects your final submission points to do it late. Are you with me? So you should do it anyways, even if you haven't done it by the deadline. But the final submission is only the three points. So you've you got to do the part by when it's due, which is one week after we've done it in class. 
So today I'm going to show you how to kind of uh, uh, use the system. Now, doing the pre-lab is not just, um, what do you call, um, s summarize the background. You actually have to look through those resources. And in three, the three activities were designed to get you thinking about what, um, what cladograms are really about, how trees of life are made, right? And there was uh, two bulletin videos, one of them in which he actually walks through the whole process. There's an NCBI video from the people that actually made it that explains how to use it. There's an HHMI video that explains how to use it. And then there's the actual uh, AP lab, investigative lab instructions. It doesn't take a night to do that. So people texting at 11.30 last night on how to do this, see, that's a problem, okay? Meanwhile, I have other people on Sunday asking me, Sunday, many days ago, asking me, yo, Lima, the links are not working. That's the spirit. Are you with me what I'm saying? Days before, you need to stop thinking of deadlines as the day that you need to do it. Deadlines is the last day by which you should have, should, you, that's the last day to turn it in. It is very dangerous to do that way. Think about, think, I told you about this at the beginning of the year. Think about applying the same philosophy in other ways in your life. Okay? For example, the last day to do something that would, be save, that would save your life. You have three months to live. Right? So you have three months to get things done. So you just keep counting the day. On the last day, you do something about it. Is that going to make a difference? Right? Or let's think about it another way. You have several days to apply for college. Right? And then you say the deadline is January 2nd. And then on January 1st, you start contacting the teachers, writing your essays to get, is that going to work? You have three months to finish building a road. Otherwise, you don't get the bonus, the double pay that you get if you're an engineer for building the road. Are you with me? And then they say if you finish it by January 1st, you get $2 billion. If you don't finish it, it's just $1 billion. Right? So December 1st, you start worrying about starting to build the road. Is that going to work? No. no. You're a doctor, okay? And you're trying to submit a paper for a research publication in a journal. And the last day to submit the paper is December 1st. All right? November 30th, you're writing the paper. Is that going to work? At some point in your life, you have to stop thinking of deadlines as the date by which you do things. All right? So you need to do... If the reading suggested reading list is at, they do every Saturday, you start on Monday, 30 minutes a day every day reading that for that. And reading is not just reading, it's study, right? So whether, and I, I have a lot of people in here that, that have talked about this. Does reading, the reading doesn't work for me. Like, you know, that Campbell Biology book is so dry, it's such tiny letters. Yeah, All right? Then there's a folder called Videos and Repertorials for Every Topic that has animations on it. There's the podcast folder with a billion teachers in there, all right? And then there's a worksheets folder. There, there is the review workbook. There's the lecture outlines. There's my videos. There are uh, lots of other options. Now, on Biology 101 and 102, when you take microbiology, when you take uh, biochemistry, you take genetics, or whatever other thing you're going to take if you're going to go into this path, there's not going to be a teacher online with all these resources. It's the book. So at what point you're going to start transitioning if you're going to be in higher education in sciences, right? And if you're not doing sciences, it's the same thing for whatever you're doing. If you're going to do it to social studies. Are you with me? So at some point, you've got to get used to doing the book. All right? Having said that, my, uh, my fiance takes, um, is taking uh, master courses. And there's books for her to read. They don't always read the book, right? Sometimes you can just get away without reading it or reading just enough of it to get through it. Are you with me what I'm saying? You do what you can. But the point of it is, should you have had the time to actually read the book? Do you think you'll learn more? Yes. It's one more way for you to learn. Ideally, you do all of it. Well, who has that time? So you find the thing that works best for you right now. And right now, you have lots of options. But you should also read the book. And I tell you, there's a lot of correlation between the kids that do it and the kids that get great scores. That's all I'm going to say. And then, lab two. Now, it will be very hard for you to follow along on the video on what I'm doing over here. That's three, actually. Uh, but 
Today, all I want to talk about is the expectations for the lab. What are you supposed to do in all of this? Okay? So we're going to hold on a second. Scrolling down. Now, this is all stuff you should have done already. Okay? Now, these three things here, that's why I said, including all activities, list of investigative labs, actually turning in work is extra credit. Because all this is really is, a pre, is an activity that you're doing to learn about cladograms. There's nothing really that you can do to get points for it on some of them, right? But any evidence that you've actually done, I'll give you a, po I'll give you a point. That's what that's all about, okay? Now, these, it takes time to go through these resources. Like even only one video of this, there's the HDMI, this video right here, review this video right here, that alone is like nine minutes or something like that. So you can't do this in one day just spending 50 minutes a day in the lab, okay? It's not the right ideal thing to do. Now, let's look over these activities. Yes, what happened? For the, um, <laughs> <laughs> it works, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. It's extra credit. I'll give it to you if there's any evidence that you've done it. Okay. 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 So, <laughs> let's, look at, let's look at these things. Are they young? Open. Okay. Each of these things is one grade. You know how in the other lab you have these quest, uh, quest points that you could get? Just like this, there could be another quest point that you can get. Each of these things is one of the things you can do. How many of them do you have to do? Half, Half of them. Can you do all of them? Yes. What happens if you do extra? It goes to the game. All right, and then it helps you level up and get the bonus. That protects you and creates a cushion from the test. I did not do a test for this period, did I? Is that why I'm here? Homeroom. Homeroom? Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> oh, in my face. Look at that. Yeah, Lima, live by example. <laughs> not by words. Yeah. There's a lot of people here. Who's number 11? 11, 23, no, 23 has an ID card in there? So, uh, 24 and 20, 23, 24 and 25. Uh, Sasser is, okay, so you guys all have the wrong numbers. Okay, so at the end of class today, I'll, I'll put the numbers on the board so that we can see. Um, let me see. I see, I see all these people, I saw all these people here already. Cheryl? So the only one that's early here, let's see, number 11, Enzo, is your Mariah, Vanessa Martinez, Vanessa Martinez, that's the one that's not here, okay, alright, so let me show you a few of them, so this is the first one, Okay, this is actually a very easy one. In the beginning, it will walk you through how trees of life are built, right? So, it, huh? Well, it's a, a, it's a quest point, yes. It's a stop on your quest, yes. All right, so as you're walking through the forest, you see a pot, like, sitting in front of you. There is papers that tell you how to do cladograms. Do you choose to engage or not, right? So say the dungeon master, and then that's when you say... Yes, yeah, sure. Okay, roll an initiative. Never mind. Okay. <laughs> have you ever played Dungeons and Dragons? Raise your hand if you have. Oh, the lack of childhood. Seriously. Imagination, man. It's like having an adventure. It is really fun. All right. So, it tells you. It tells you how to create the tree of life in the process of actually doing it. All right? So then, these animals are animals that you have to classify. Now, in this particular activity, there is no right answer. You do not have to classify the same way a true biologist would classify them. You are creating the criteria that you're using to split them. Are you with me? So that's how you're supposed to do. So you're supposed to put them all in a tree of life. So it all starts with something simple. Like they say here, you pick a characteristic. So you could say, for they're, they're all mammals, I think. So you could say, for, oh, no, they're not. All right, so you could be like, okay, vertebrate versus invertebrate. And that could be your first split. 
And then what you do with the foam paper, by the way, the best way to do this is actually cut them all out, all right, and put them in piles. So, so, so you literally put it, this table would be ideal to do it because you can even write on them. So you can just put vertebrates, non-vertebrates, and that's your first split. Then you worry about those later. Let's talk about the invertebrates, all right? And you say radial symmetry versus bilateral symmetry, right? Then you put everybody that has radial symmetry one way, everybody with bilateral symmetry the other way, right? But I still have three that have radial symmetry. So then you say um, complex brain, non-complex brain. You see, you come up with ways to slowly but surely, one split at a time, do what? Separate them all in one branch each, right? But anybody that's in a faraway branch would have to have all of these steps saying yes. You, so you're creating a dichotomous key as you go through it, to are you with me I'm saying? And splitting them in that, that. That's the first activity. And this do, yes? Mm -hmm. Yes? Go ahead. If we, do, if, if we do that, can we take a picture and then attach it to the... Well, actually, that's, that is what you do. You're oh. supposed to do it, take a picture, answer the questions, and that's how you do it. Oh. Yes. Okay? Okay. Super easy. Yes. Yes. Well, that's due next week. No, we're not going to. The final submission won't be due by the end of this quarter. Yes. Actually, part A is due a week after Monday. Yeah, because we see each other Monday, correct? Uh, so the next, a week after that, part A will be due. Yes. No, it's due, but it doesn't affect your grade. Really? We have limited time. It's an early release day. Why would you ask such a question? Everything, hey, from now on, I told you, everything goes in one single Google doc document that you're doing little by little. Are you with me? So today's pre live, you put in a document. And then you put part A, activity one, put in a document, right? By the way, the activity has questions too. It's not just the picture. Right, you have to answer questions and stuff. All right, look, look at this one. Yes. <laughs> Sorry? Whatever it says to do. Okay. Now, on this one, you're given, um, it's not letting me see. Okay, there it is. On this one, it's a little different. They teach you how, I like this one even better than the other one, because they actually teach you how the, to build good trees, which is actually something that we have to do to, have to, do to understand how this works. And in, in the FRQ, you're going to be given this for sure soon. But I'm going to go over that next class because the next class is 1B2. And so I'm going to go over that next class. But this activity will go over it before then. And it's actually be a good idea for you guys to do this one before next class. All right? So check out how this works. Basically, you're supposed to identify for each organism listed, you pick certain characteristics. And then you list yes or no on the characteristics for each organism. Are you with me? Look at the example that they did. All right? So there's definitely different organisms, and I pick different characteristics. All right? It's okay. I, I pick different characteristics. Are you with me? So, for example, they pick body shape, they pick color, the head color. I can pick different things, but they pick different characteristics, and they basically say what the characteristics the organism has. Right? Then you can sort this by which organism has yes to most, or by which, you know what I'm saying? And then you can, uh, because whoever has most of the characteristics would have to be a higher step on your tree. Are you with me? Whoever has less characteristics should be early in your tree. Are you with me? Okay. So that's another way to do it. So you see this guy? Look at the way they did it. This is brilliant. So this E and A has seven characteristics in common. Are you with me? What does that mean about E and A? They have to be what? Close together. Oh, actually, is, is this the number of differences? Let me let me count first. Differences. There are differences. Oh. Okay. Oh. So that forget that then. Okay. So then, who is supposed to be really close together? A and B, and that's what they did over here. Oh, right. But you also see that C and F have to be together because it's also one, and they put them together, right? So by looking at the number of differences, you built a tree that makes the most sense. Are you with me? So the first three pages just teach you how to do that. All right, literally read through it, and it's just how to do that. Then, <coughs> they ask you to do it yourself. A little exercise. Are you with me? Um, and they actually teach you, for example, this would mean they only have one difference. 
but A and C are connected two steps away from each other. So if, if you forget the other ones, it would be two steps away. So let's say that, that, that A and C did not, there was no B and there was no F, but A and C have two differences. So you would draw it like this. C and A, and you would draw it longer than you would draw A and B. So A and B you draw close because they're close together. Are you with me? So even, so things that I've, even if B and F were like D and E here, yeah. right? Because that means that yes, they're connected, but they're not so close as A and B are close. So when you do this, that's how you built it. They're teaching you how to do it. We know that A and B have to be really close. We know that C and F have to be really close, right? And you know that A and C have to be really close because A and C would have been like this. Therefore, it's like this, all put together, right? B and D and E are really far apart. So then I put that together, and then you see? It teaches you how to do it, all right? And as you follow through, now they're going to give you flowers. You pick the characteristics. You do it. You do the process. Are you with me? And then they give you birds, and you do it, all right? So what are you supposed to do? Do exactly what they did on the example above for both of these. You got it? This is a really good one to work on. Easy. You have a weekend and some little days to do it. Now, this is the Whipple evolution example. Um, it's interesting because Whipples, or the Whipple family, includes a lot of different types of things, including the black bear, the harp seal, the hyopotamus, the sea otter, the penguin, and the harbor porpoise, and even the blue whale. Now, this is actually showing you something different. The other examples showed you that we could use physical characteristics to make do the tree. But you can also do it based on what? Right. So this has both things. It has the niche, it has the, the anatomy, and then it has the DNA. So looking at the total combination of evidence, you have to decide how to build a tree with that. Are you with me? So that's the, the chart that you use to create the information. On the other two handouts, it has the instructions and then the, the, the questions. Right? That's a good one too. So I like it because the first one is just like no right answer, just have fun with it. The second one, help build your skill of how to build trees based on criteria of differences and similarities. The third one has the DNA and the niche to it, right? And then this one, bioinformatics one. That's like, okay, now I'm people how to do it. Let's do this right. Let's do a real clear of life using DNA information and stuff like that. So, and they so they, basically they tell you to do it with humans. Are you with me? They tell you to do it with humans. And just do it. If you think of no one, all right? Everything you need is over here. Yes? Yes, but how much do you have to do? That's right. Only half of part eight? No. The whole thing is due. But half is required. Right? It's not this Monday. It's the other Monday. I don't know. I mean, it's yes. Yes. Now, notice though that this last one, hey, this last, questions like that can be Sally questions so you don't waste class time. Right? This one right here is extra. Now, remember in the lab, half is already extra if you think about it because you only have to do half. But when you have this extra here, what that means is that that one does not count for the point total. Right? So in this particular lab, you can go, technically, you can go over the point total. You can do 22 out of 20 if that's, yeah, are you with me? Okay. This is a different monster altogether. So I am going to try my best to reserve the computer lab next class. If so, you will be notified by, by um, Sally that you're supposed to report there instead of reporting here, okay? And then if, if so, you have to bring on a flash drive those gene files that, you already, that I already gave it to you so we can play with this together next class, all right? But basically, you're gonna look in the, in the handout of the AP Investigative Lab. They have like this, you should both read through it, Right? You're supposed to have to write the whole thing. So they have this little cladogram of this fossil that was found. Right? And in this fossil, they found four genes. They actually found some tissue, some soft tissue, and they got four genes out of it. And they analyzed, and what we're going to do is we're going to analyze these genes using, the, the, using BLAST. 
and to try to find which branch of the tree of life this fossil belongs to. Now you can kind of tell from the shape of the skeleton and compared to the skeletons of the other ones, and it kind of, you, it's, it's, it's hard to tell. Looking at it, it could be a bird, it could be a reptile, it could be even maybe an early mammal, we don't know, right? But we're trying to find out. So what's the process? The first step is you're going to literally build that tree of life, the same one that's in the paper, in the, right? And you're going to put them right here. It's like, I think it's here. You're just going to make a prediction, right? I think it belongs right here, a branch off this branch. Are you with me? Then you're going to collect the data during the procedures as listed in the introduction of the You're going to run blast for all genes one through four, okay? And no actual proof is required that you're running it because there's no way to prove it. Uh, as, but I'm actually changing that criteria because you can take a snapshot of your run yeah. and place it on the document. Okay? Now, so results. Presenting evidence from BLAST to support your analysis statement that would be said below. Okay? Enough evidence considering all requirements listed below as well as additional written explanations uh, that you feel may be required for each BLAST in general. In addition, screenshots, printouts of each BLAST result, the tree view, all of that kind of stuff should be included. When you run BLAST, all of these things are things you can do. Basically, you're going to collect evidence from BLAST and from your logic and everything to support the analysis you're going to try to do it at the end. Right? So that is what you need to do. You have to write a, write a report. There's no criteria for this. You just have to do it. You have to convince me with evidence that your final analysis is right. You right? Or not well. Okay. So, next class, as we go into the last... By the way, I already introduced part A. So, uh, and it's supposed to be a week from today, but I'll give you a week from Monday to do on that. Part B will be on Monday. We're going to go over it, all right? And then I'll give you not to the Monday, but to the week after that Monday, so two weeks after that Monday, to finish Part B, all right? Part C will only be due for a long time from now, okay? But next class, we'll talk about Part B. And next class, we'll also talk about phylogenetic trees. And why is it that biologists today no longer classify things in groups? We don't put things necessarily, well, we still do it because we talk about reptiles and they're a group. But it's more, it's smarter. Instead of using classification to actually use trees of life, which tells us the history of that the organism is going, um, and the, the history that he's been through. We'll talk more about this next time. Do not do that in the middle of a, of a speech. No, it doesn't matter. I'm just trying to say right now. Okay? It's rude, right? You wait for a pause, and then you press. Okay? Okay. Yes? Yes. I was introducing both things today. What matters is that you have to do part A by not this Monday, the Monday after. And then the Monday after, part B will be due. Is that clear? It's not five. We have to do two. Right? Four is what you can do. Five is an extra one. Two are required, right? If you're going to do two, you can do the two easier ones, right? But really, the bioinformatics one is what you should be shooting for. And that's why it's worth more. Okay, the bioinformatics one is worth two points. All right, guys, see you later. I love it. Yes, yes, yes. Cool. The numbers on the board. Huh? Numbers. We'll do it next time. Thanks, man. Mm -hmm. I have a B in the investigation one.